Um, before we get started, I'm going to go over the agenda real quick. Uh, just some quick logistics, uh, safety logistics. I think most folks are familiar with the library. Uh, if we need to exit in a hurry for whatever reason, the quickest exit is right here immediately to your left. Of course, you got the main doors and the uh, restrooms straight down the hall on your right. So um, let's uh, go ahead and go, go over the agenda real quick, and we'll kind of set the stage of, of why we're here. Um, I'm Dieter Borman. I'm uh, with Northwind. Uh, right now, I support the Office for Protection and Public Affairs. And uh, we're going to hear tonight from both offices of the Department of Energy. We have Greg Jones from the Richmond Operations Office. We have John Pichon from the Office for Protection. And then we will hear from the Hempert Site Regulatory Oversight Agencies. We have John Price from the Department of Ecology. And we have Laura Bulo from the Environmental Protection. Um, we're going to hear from these folks in order, from Craig left to right, and then uh, we're going to, if we can, hold questions until the end. If, if you have some clarifying questions, we go, you know, feel free to jump in, but we're going to try to hold the majority of our questions uh, to the end. We should have plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, following that, we're going to have, and the folks that were here last year, remember we did kind of a priorities uh, poster session and what we're asking folks to do is tell us um, and last year we wrote on the posters themselves this year we're going to try to see if we can reuse some of these posters if possible we're going to use sticky notes um, so we will uh, pass these out um, and we'll just ask you to write from from the Richland side they have 12 posters so from 1 to 12 what if if we had uh, you know, with the funding that we do Get, what is your top priority number one being the highest down to 12 and then since we do get different uh, congressional allocations for Richland office and for the office of river protection we have five posters for the office of river protection so I'm kind of going to ask you to keep those priorities separate so you'll rank Richland 1 through 12 and office of river protection 1 through 5 so we'll go over that again as we so we get to go through the meeting. Um, this uh, this meeting and, and today also kicks off a 30-day public comment period where we take input on the 2020, the fiscal year 2020 budget. I know that seems like way out there. We're here in April of 2018. So, you know, why are we talking about 2020? And that's just how the budget cycle works and we'll I think, probably get into that a little bit more as we hear about the uh, current appropriation and the priorities, uh, the projects that we're working on now, those that we're looking at in the next fiscal year, which starts on October 1st, and then farther out, what your comments can help us do from, uh, from 2020, fiscal year 2020 and beyond, is help us uh, you know, determine what your priorities are for uh, the, the projects that are, that are funded out at, at hand for doing this. Sometimes we have uh, difficult choices to make with how those funds are allocated. Um, like I said, again, we're taking comments now through May 25th. From today through May 25th, we're going to take those by email. Probably the easiest way to provide comments to us. You can also provide them in writing here um, in the email address and the uh, address up here. They're also on the uh, agendas that we have up front. Any questions on that? They do. Good question. We will uh, tally up the one through twelve. We'll, uh, we'll put those in, in a summarized report that will go up with our budget uh, request submission to uh, the headquarters and then and beyond. So I just. Uh, through this slide up there to kind of set the kind of you are here context. Um, we're in the spring, obviously. Uh, and again, uh, we're looking at input for the fiscal year 2020 budget. The Department of Energy is uh, uh, preparing to make that submission here in the late spring, early summer time frame. And what we will include in that submission is uh, the public comments that are received here in the next 30 days. 
go along with the input that we get on, on the posters. Do I have that right, John, Greg, does that sound? Okay. Um, again, we will be talking some about uh, what we're doing in FY18 and 19, uh, but for the comments, you know, we're looking really for your input on FY20. Okay, so well, why don't we, uh, without further ado, get started. Any, anything else? Any other questions before we start uh, with Mr. Jones here? All right. Go ahead, Greg, take it away. I'm going to stand up, get some energy going in this room, okay? Probably like many of you, I've been up since about we're working since about 6 this morning, so at 6.45, I'm going to stand up, give us some energy in this room so I can talk to you with a little more vigor. So here, as uh, Dieter mentioned, we're, we're here to talk about really the 2020 budget submittal, which, as he's mentioned, is way out there, but we're going to submit it to headquarters with a bunch of deliverables pretty darn soon, and then it's going to go to the Office of Management and Budget. Ultimately, it goes to Congress and Hopefully, we get an appropriation a little sooner than we did this year because we got our final omnibus this year, March 23rd of this year. So we we're almost six months into the fiscal year when we got our budget, which does make budget planning fairly difficult. So I'm going to go through just sort of a high-level overview, and then we're going to talk about some of the specific projects that we do at the Richland Operations Office, ultimately trying to get you all to help us to prioritize out of all this work, what is your highest priority, second priority, third priority. It is all important. Almost every bit of it is tied to some way, shape, or form to regulatory milestones. But what happens is we have a finite sized pie. So we need to know if, in fact, we don't get all the money we need to get compliance done in a certain year, what have we prioritized? So, big picture, as you know, that's the Hanford site. We're down here on the right in Richland. There's areas of the, the, the site we call the uh, there's a tank waste mission, there's the central plateau, which is in the middle of the blue, and then the remainder is really the river corridor. We've been focusing on trying to get off of the river corridor and get focused in the central plateau. We've done a lot of work in the river corridor, which I'm going to tell you about in a little bit. The ultimate cleanup work at 30,000 foot level, retrieve waste from underground tanks, treat it, treat groundwater, demolish facilities, and remove buried waste and soil from uh, near the Columbia River, get it up into the central plateau. So that's like the 50,000 foot, what are we doing at Hanford for $2.5 billion cleanup money? There we go. Um, now I'm focusing on the Richland Operations Office. The Department of Energy gets our work done through contractors, right? We, do, we get money, we formulate budgets, and we obligate money to contracts. The contractors are the ones that do the work. Um, so it's very important on the Richland side to know who those contractors are. We have CH2M used to be called CH2 on Hill, and we have a mission support contract. Those are our major contractors. We have 150 other small contractors that do everything from laundry, steam, all sorts of other stuff. But these are the main contractors that do the cleanup and support work. I'm going to just move on because this isn't the meat of our discussion. OK, it's a little bit of an eye chart, but I'm trying to give you some context here. Um, FY17 budget, this is how we formulate our budget. Central plateau, control point, river corridor, control point and then a number of other pieces and parts that make up the budget. So if you look in the FY17 budget, we got $916 million enacted. We, I just told you we got $947 million in the 18 budget. Put this in context, the president's request in FY18 was $800 million. And the president's request for FY19 is $747 million. So nearly a $200 million reduction. So I'm going to give you some more context. I just told you that in 18, the president's request was uh, 800 million. We got 947 million dollars. We certainly can put this money to good work, getting cleanup done. Um, over the last five to ten years, um, the president's budget uh, has been lower than the enacted budget over multiple different administrations by nearly 100 million dollars a year on the Richmond Operations Office side. So. So what are we doing with this money? Um, clearly, we're trying to focus on safety and health. We have thousands of workers going to work every day out there. We want to make sure they get home safely. Um, it's not easy. I mean, we have construction hazards. We have occupational hazards. We have you know, normal OSHA stuff, slips, trips, falls, snow, 
We also are working in a radiological environment, um, and we have chemical hazards. So we have a lot of hazards on this site. So when we talk about safety and health, there's a huge spectrum of uh, areas we need to focus on to ensure that people get home safely every day. And we don't control everything. One of the things we're trying to focus on is, um, if you recall, that last year we had Purex Tunnel 1, which we weren't going to work on for quite a long time. We had a subsidence, which is a part cave-in of the tunnel, and no real exposure, but we realized if it had a huge subsidence or collapse, we could have some serious exposure. So what did we do? We worked with our regulators, we put some money, and we focused on getting that tunnel stabilized, and what we did was we put a grout into it, right? But we call it interim stabilization because if we need to or when we need to, you could cut it up and put it in earth at some point in time. But the key was trying to make sure that it was protective of the people that work there and, and the people in our community in case we had a collapse. That's what we're talking about. So safety and health runs from the gamut of trying to ensure that people that are working are safe to ensuring that we're getting the work done so the community and the river is safe, so to speak. Um, we are working on PFB. I'm going to talk a little more about that in a few minutes. Uh, we're resuming uh, demolition activities soon. We have voluntary protection programs. As you know, the integrated safety management system is a big focus for us. We try and ensure that everybody understands the hazards, understands the risks before we go to work. So now we're into the real work that we do. In order to get to work every day, we have to do what we call, it's not flashy, it's not sexy, but you have to have water, you have to have power, you have to have roads, you have to have um, uh, insect repellent, you know, I mean literally everything from soup to nuts so you can have people go to work every day. We call that site-wide services. Um, we also provide things like cranes for the projects. Um, this is a lot of the work that the mission support contract does to enable both the plateau remediation contractor as well as the Washington River Protection's tank farm contractor to do their work. It's a funding source that we have now uh, utilized. We call it PBS 201. So it's, like I said, it's not flashy. It's not necessarily progressing cleanup, but you can't do cleanup without it, okay? You have to have potable water. You have to have water, sewer. You have to have electricity in order to enable cleanup. So that's one of the areas. Most people don't prioritize it, but we have to. So. <laughs> Infrastructure, similar to site-wide services, this, some of this is funded separately. Uh, we have, you can see the statistics, hundreds of miles of buried pipe. We utilize 900 million gallons of water on the Amperd side a year. Electrical utilities, emergency systems, and a lot of this stuff is aging. You can see um, much of this stuff is undersized pipe, there's leaks, and in a hazardous environment that potentially has radioactivity, you do not want water leaks. So we're trying to put a focus, I'm just using that as an example, to ensure that we are fixing the water lines on the Hanford site as part of infrastructure. We also have power poles that are decades old. You know, the old power poles, and every once in a while we get a little wind out here, right? Some of them have been snapping. I'm surprised they didn't uh, last Tuesday when I was on the site and it's blowing 40 miles an hour. So. And we have 7,600 passenger vehicles daily. There's 350 miles of roads. This is um, infrastructure work that we, we need to continue to work on because realistically, we have our environmental liability, our to-go costs for cleanup on the financial statements of the Department of Energy for Hanford. Take a guess. The idea? But the to-go costs for cleanup are on the financial statements of the Department of Energy. Come on. Jerry, you don't know this? $150 billion to go costs. $150 billion. That's on the financial statements of the Department of Energy. So the point is you can't be in just a closure mentality. You have to invest in your infrastructure because we're going to be here a while getting all this work done and all that work done in the back. So that's what infrastructure is all about. Once again, not necessarily the cleanup progress, but you have to have these things in order to get cleanup done. So now I'm getting to, that's sort of the enablers of work, now I'm getting into the, the specific project work. And I'm going on FY 2018 um, just because of the work we're doing right now. So much of this work will continue. Um, so we have reactors in the uh, 100 area, K-West reactor, and then we have um, sludge on the river. So we, if you recall, we had spent fuel in the K-East and K-West basins um, in the 100 area. 
We got all those fuel rods, we got them packaged, we got them uh, delivered to the canister storage building, the big green building in the middle of the site. Um, so that's good news. Unfortunately, we had sludge that had decayed out of those spent fuel rods, etc. And it's a hazard, it's in you know, water in essence, so we got the sludge transferred, it's now all in the K West Basin. We put in a process in place that we've been training for um, for a long time to ensure that we can safely get that sludge packaged and off the river up to tea plant in a safe configuration and our intent is to dewater the basin and get both uh, K East and K West reactor into an interim safe storage mode like we have six other reactors on the Hanford site. So that's what we're talking about doing here um, regarding sludge treatment uh, and getting the, walk, the sludge off the river. We just had an operational readiness review. I sat in on an outbrief on uh, Tuesday of last week to ensure the contractor's ready. Um, the contractor passed the readiness review. They have some pre-start activities that have to get accomplished before they can actually proceed. But we're really, really close, which is nice. That'd be a nice thing to get accomplished in the next little bit of time. So that's PBS 12. Everybody's familiar with how we fund. We have these project baseline summaries, right? These project baseline summaries are just a way that we package our budgets to prepare for Congress, okay? And they have they just have these random numbers, 11, 12, 13, 40, 41, but so I'm gonna try and explain the work as opposed to the number. Don't worry about the number so much. Focus on as you're looking at this the work that we're talking about. As you can see over here, we don't even tie it to the PBS, but that's how we fund it. If you see a chart with all of our budget on it, it will be linked to those numeric um, categorization. Okay, so this is river corridor work. Uh, we've been working diligently for years to try and get off the river. Um, we've completed just the 61810 burial grounds. Matter of fact, we completed it so well, we're transferring it to Mission Support Alliance so they can do the revenge and we're gonna be done with that project. That's good work. We have the 61811 burial ground. We are not starting yet because it's right by the Energy Northwest plant. They do not want us to start. They have some NRC issues, etc. So that's still in abeyance. Um, there's a waste site under the 324 building, which is pretty close, you know, remember that map, pretty close to Richland. And it's very, very radiologically hot waste site. 12,000 R, you know, if you look, a lot of times when we talk about radioactivity, we talk in millirems. This is R, so 1,000 times more. It's really, really radiologically hot. So we are working diligently, our contractor, to get that waste site taken care of, and then ultimately um, excavate the 320, or excavate under it, and then ultimately we intend to demolish the 224 building. Uh, so that's PBS 41. The good news is we don't have nearly as much work in this, the river corridor as we used to. We've done a tremendous amount of progress um, in the river corridor. So we're trying to now focus in the center plateau. Plutonium finishing plant. So I know you've read the paper. We're working diligently to get that project to slab on a grade. We're, you know, we're getting ready to resume demolition. We put an expert panel in place. I'm going to give you just a little bit of context, though, because um, I think it's important. Um, so there was a, an unplanned contamination release at the plutonium finishing plant, um, one small one in, in June and one bigger one in December. It's bad when that happens, right, especially unplanned. But here's the context I'm going to give you. Unfortunately, they had to do around 250 plus little more bioassays, which means people that had some exposure had to, you know, figure out exactly what happened, you send stuff to labs. The good news is, the worst exposure was 13 milligrams over a 50 year life, okay? So, I'm gonna explain that to you. When a person's normal, um, well, exposure limit for a radiological worker is 500 milligram for a year, right? So, it's not good, but I'm trying to put it in context. We had somebody who was working planned work in the 300, 296 hot, uh, in the hot cell in the 324 building, and they took 130 millirem on a shift. It was planned, it happens you know, rather frequently. At West Valley, they have people working in hot cells, and they take about 100 millirem per shift. So, this is not good to have exposures at all. I'm just trying to give you a little context that an unplanned activity resulted in something 500 times less than something that happens on a shift 
not on a daily basis, but rather frequently on a planned basis. So uh, we need to understand our controls, we need to understand the work, but I think in general we also need to put in context um, what's actually happening. Oh. I got off track, sorry. Oh, Susan? So actually plan to expose people? That's what you just said. There are times when that's why they wear anti-contamination suits, but there are times you don't purposely expose people, but it, in some cases, like I'll use the West Valley example, it is a planned activity that during their shift, okay. it is likely that may, they may take 100 milligrams on this work. Okay. So, okay, I got off track. So, we gotta get PFP done. One, it needs to occur. We're behind on the TPA milestone. And two, it is a tremendous burden on our budget, so we need to get it done so we can do some of this other work. But I didn't want to talk to a public and not talk about getting PFP accomplished. So, Solid and liquid base management. This is a, a little bit of a catch-all. We do a whole bunch of stuff up here. I talked about tea plant. You've heard about the environmental restoration disposal facility. We have the waste encapsulation storage facility, which has these really interesting and cool cesium and strontium capsules, which is uh, almost 50% of the radioactivity curies on the Hanford site. They are in wet storage, and we intend to get them into dry storage because that is what they call our largest beyond design basis threat that we have on the Hanford site. If there was potentially some huge earthquake or something, the basin lost water, you could have some bad stuff happen. It's not likely. It's not even in our documented safety analysis that it will occur, but the impact of it, if it did occur, is so great that we think we need to get this accomplished. So we are going to put money on this, get this focused. We work with our regulators for the most part. They think this is a good idea too, and as, as does the department. So, um, and then in this PBS, we have a tremendous amount of both remote and contact handled transuretic waste that we need to get um, some of it uh, dug up. Some of it's already dug up, and we need to get it packaged, certified, and shipped to the waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico. We're not on the list yet. We're not on the criteria to get into WIC because, as you know, it was shut down for almost two years, um, so they're behind. But when it is, we need to be prepared to get this accomplished. So that's what this uh, PBS does. Groundwater. This has been our flagship of cleanup. Uh, we've had tremendous success. Um, when we had the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, John Bishong and I were right there arm in arm doing this. And one of the things we did is we built the Central uh, Plateau uh, Pumpetry Facility. That and combined with the work in the river corner, we're treating 2.2 billion gallons of contaminated groundwater and getting many, many contaminants. Uh, you can see here removing uranium, carbon tetrachloride, nitrates, hexavalent chromium, and technetium. This is a real cleanup. This is ensuring that our groundwater doesn't have those chemicals in it to get to the river. So we're very, very proud of this. We're going to continue to do this work. So when you see groundwater in there, this is something we think is important. We're going to continue to do, and we're making very, very real progress. Um, there's also much more groundwater work to do. Part of groundwater program is what's called the Deep Vado Zone. It's it's in essence from ground level to the groundwater. You have this thing called the Vado zone. There's contamination that's held up in there. We need to get that work accomplished, but we first need to understand by doing what we call remedial investigation feasibility studies to get the paperwork and um, documentation to characterize and understand what we need to do in the Vado zone. So, um, and there's many other records of decisions related to all sorts of different types of plumes, including the uh, a groundwater uranium plume in the southern part of the 200 East area, which is where um, the VIT plant is and uh, many of the other tank farms. Um, PBS 40, this, this particular PBS is a, a little bit of a catch-all PBS, but some of the true cleanup work we're doing in here, this is where we're funding. We funded Purex Tunnel 1, and we when we did look at Tunnel 1, we went and looked at the engineering drawings for Purex Tunnel 2. This is, they were built differently. One's three, the Purex Tunnel 1 is like 300 some odd feet long. Purex Tunnel 2 is over 1,000 feet long. It's built like a Quonset hut. And when they looked at the engineering drawings, some of the engineers in our office about, it went white. You know what I mean? 
This is potentially something that could also have some collapse, so we're putting a focus on it. We put in our budget submittal to get uh, some risk remediation, and it's something that we're working diligently to try and get permitted with the Department of Ecology to get uh, um, stabilized. Because we also don't want that to have a collapse and potentially have a release. So uh, that's, that's an important activity we're working on. FFTF. A number of years ago, we, we worked on FFTF to get it cheap to cheap. Um, it's about $2 million, $2.4 million a year. It's actually in a different bucket. This is a non-defense bucket. Most of our work comes out of the defense program. This comes out of non-defense. So um, it's in a mode where we're, we're not working to get it demolished, et cetera. We work with our regulators um, a number of years ago. And instead of spending that finite pie on FFTF demolition, and we got it into a cheap to keep mode. And so it's sort of in a um, holding pattern for a little while. We think that we can put our cleanup dollars to better use doing many of these other activities in the near term. Safeguard security, this budget, <clears throat> um, it's, a, it's a national program, DOE Hanford. Uh, we look at and determine what activities we need to do, but much of this budget comes from drivers from headquarters related to you know super secret security stuff. Um, as well as a lot of cybersecurity issues are occurring across all of the world, but government as well, whether it's, uh, uh, so there's a lot of requirements that are continuing to focus on cybersecurity. So safeguard security budget is, is another thing that we, we focus on. Um, we also have what's called community and regulatory support. Um, in, in this current fiscal year, um, we changed how we funded some work. So. Uh, this PBS used to fund the work that we have with our regulators, so the circular grant and the mixed waste fee used to be in this budget. It's no longer in this in this budget anymore. It's in that uh, PBS 201 budget, site-wide services. Um, this includes now, um, yeah, it's, it used to be in here in, in uh, previous years. It's not in 19 and 20. Um, now this budget includes uh, the Department of uh, Oregon Department of Energy, Hanford Advisory Board. There's a Washington military grant, an emergency preparedness grant, to ensure that the counties around us are prepared in, in case we have an emergency. So it's it's relatively small in the future. So. Um, we talked a little bit about this. Um, I'm not going to go into it anymore. I think you understand what I'm talking about as you look to prioritization. So let's talk a little bit about river quarter remaining work. We have some orchard lands. There's some uh, uh, arsenic and other things that uh, are in these orchard lands here. We have the 618 burial ground, FFTF, the 324 building, groundwater operations, and K East and West reactor ISS. So but that's the remaining work to do in the river quarter. The other work, tons and tons of work is complete. So we're very proud of that. Um, we intend to focus on some of these things in the near future. Others, we're going to um, continue to kick the can because I think from a relative prioritization standpoint, there may be some other important work. So. And I know I got to talk too fast. There's too much to cover. I apologize. But I'm going to turn it over to John. We'll be standing around here. We can answer questions. But the real focus is come and try and help us prioritize to the extent you can what you think are the most important activities at the Richard Operations Office on these 12 charts. So you get one through 12, go to way. Thank you. All right, thanks, Greg. Hi, I'm John Peshaw, I'm with the Office of River Protection. And one way I look at Hanford is, you know, there's the, the tanks, the 177 tanks. And that's what I'm going to talk about. And there's everything else. And that's what Greg just talked about. So you'll be hearing a lot about tanks in the next next couple of minutes. I'm going to talk about the FY18 and FY19 budget. Just figures coming up. So, you know, we've had about 5,000 contractors, uh, cleanup contractors working on tanks and about 225 federal employees uh, combined with some support services contractors. So. We think our mission and our vision is very important to state. You know, and our mission is really just twofold. When you talk about tanks, there's two things to talk about. One is this physical condition that we have right now, those 177 tanks in the ground, and that highly radioactive, highly hazardous waste that's in those tanks. And safekeeping those tanks is just is, is part of our mission. It's, it's very important. And the second part of our mission is removing that waste from those tanks and treating it. 
we'll talk about both today. But when it comes to the uh, vision, we really want to have those 5,000 contractors, those people, those men and women, as well as the federal employees and our contractors, highly motivated and safe. They're our top, they're our top priority. So those are very important to us at the Officer of Protection. This is one of my favorite photos. Um, let me orient you at first. So this is east, you know, looking east to west in this uh, photo. Um, that is Mount Rainier and Mount Adams in the background there. Um, you'll see various uh, call us little balloons. There's two colors there, green and blue. The green is the single shell tanks, which is, means that there's one layer of steel between the radioactive waste and the, um, and the environment. The blue means there's two layers of steel with a gap in between. Um, but the point I want to make here is, is this me or is this a microphone? Hold it really closely. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, the point I want to make here is there's those two areas are separated by about eight miles. And in the foreground here is the waste treatment plant facility down there in what looks like a modified home plate at a baseball stadium. And so that waste, in order to be treated, has to be transferred all the way from the 200 West area, according to current planning, all the way through the 200 East area into that. So it, it's a big geography. The second point I want to make is, and Greg alluded to it earlier, as cleanup is completed along the river corridor, the original operations office will focus their cleanup efforts in this same region. So the cleanup focus really on the entire Hanford site is moving to central, the 200 east and the 200 west areas. Key priorities. You know, whenever you have a $1.4 billion budget per year, you need to sort out the priorities. And we do have three top priorities, and they're the boxes on the left. The first one is safe nuclear operations uh, and base operations. What that really means is what I talked about the first part of the mission is to um, safe keep that nuclear waste, that hazardous waste is in the tank. It's the day-to-day -day operations, keep the exhaust running, keep the pipes from leaking, keep the valves maintained, do the corrective maintenances and the preventative maintenances that keep that waste that's in the ground, in tanks in the ground, safe. Our second priority is we're really going to be talking a lot about this. And this is the second part of the mission I alluded to earlier, and that's to remove, start removal of that waste from the tanks and start making it into a low activity waste glass in that vitrification facility. That's a package deal, and we're going to talk about that in the FY20 budget. Um, and that's about a $6 billion effort over the next 10 years. And by package deal, I mean you need the full meal deal. You need to be able to retrieve that waste from the tanks. You need to be able to remove some cesium and filter it. You need to have a vitrification facility up and running that can vitrify that or turn that waste into glass. And finally, you have to be able to put that vitrified glass in a facility in the Hanford site, and that's called the Integrated Disposal Facility. And lastly, um, not lastly, but our third priority is to continue retrieval of waste from those single shell tanks. But that can only happen in as much as we have the ability to empty the double shell tanks that the waste will go into. So it's an integrated dance that we have going out there. But those are our key priorities. Okay, we're here to talk about the budget. And any presentation would be incomplete without a chart like this. So let me just orient you on the chart first, and then we'll tell you what the numbers mean second. So on the leftmost column, you can see that that's the PBS number that that Greg alluded to earlier, and that's just a budget code that we have to display so that the budget people back in DC understand what we're saying. The second column in is a sort of a more pedestrian explanation of, of what that budget code means. And then there's three columns on the right, which are the three different years, 2017, 2018, and 2019. The 17, of course, is in the books. 18, we just got our money, like Greg mentioned. And for 19, we have a president's budget. And so what I always look for in these kind of things, what's changing? And let's just take line by line, and I'll kind of explain at a high level what's changing. And is it favorable or unfavorable to the Office of River Protection? So if you work your way down from the top to the bottom, start in the first line. And I'm going to focus on 18 to 19, OK? I'm going to focus on that. So you'll see that um, we're going to go down a little bit from 719 million to 677 million. What's happening there is a reduction in our overall funding. There's not a, no doubt about that. 
we think we can accommodate this reduction in funding with a new uh, approach to pretreatment of tank waste going from a larger facility known as the low activity waste pretreatment system to a much smaller, initially smaller pretreatment facility called the tank site season removal. Um, we also think that um, there are some uh, challenges we're going to take in single shell tank retrieval. Remember I talked about that being our third priority. So we're going to delay some work in 18 and 19 and hopefully be able to recover that schedule later on. Um, if you look at the second line, that reduction from 93 million to 56 million from 18 to 19, that's really the facility that I talked about earlier, the, the facility that we're trying to replace with a much smaller tank site season removal facility. So that's how we plan to deal with those first two lines. If you go down to about midway down, you're going to see in the left-hand column, you're going to see a series of 0060 ORP 0060s. Um, this is really mainly a redistribution of funds with, within, um, it's just a different way of adding them. The key line there is that subtotal, three lines up from the bottom. If you follow that across, it goes from 690 to 740 to 690. What that is, is an increase in uh, money going to the high level waste facility for one year. We don't know yet whether that's going to be an enduring, an enduring uh, position. So that represents a favorable thing overall. So the take home message from this whole chart is, is we're going to have some compression that we're going to have to deal with in signature tank retrievals. And for pretreatment, we're going to initiate uh, direct feed low activity waste with a smaller pretreatment facility. So there's a couple ways you can talk about, you know, ORP if you're going to deal with multiple years. Uh, one is for me just to walk you through the same subject area for both 18 and 19, right, and then walk subject area by subject area. It doesn't work very well for ORP. It's so integrated. So rather, I want to take you across the whole spectrum for each of 18 first, and then I'll repeat the, the entire spectrum of ORP for 19 seconds. So that's how we'll deal with this. So let's go to the tank farm operations. I'm not going to hit all of these, but I'm going to hit the high points. Um, the second bullet down is we do operate at 222S. It's a laboratory. It's um, it hazard. It deals with hazardous radioactive waste. That will continue to operate. It's going to operate for decades, but the main uh, emphasis is going to switch to providing feed to that retrieval system that I talked about earlier. We do run an evaporator. Basically, what it does is take tank waste and evaporate off the liquids, and make it thicker, the waste thicker. And what the advantage of that is, is it takes up less tank space in those double shell tanks and frees up space so we can do those retrievals of single shell tanks if we can. Fourth bullet down, you know, those tanks are precious real estate. We need those tanks to contain the waste, and we continue to do a lot of work in maintaining the integrity so that they can contain the waste to the maximum extent possible. Um, third bullet from the bottom, um, you know, we've had a lot of problems with vapors in the last couple of years. Um, those vapors come out of the tank waste, particularly as, you know, some of the tank waste has been in there for decades, right? And as we get in there to retrieve it, stir up that waste and mobilize it, those vapors escape. And we're going to continue to provide emphasis on um, mitigating the impacts of those vapors on our workers. This is the pretreatment system I was talking about that we're going to uh, downsize initially. Um, just to orient you on the graph, the blue is the former, and we may we may actually wind up deploying that. It's LOPS, L-A-W-P-S, the Electivity Waste Pretreatment System. Um, and the yellow is the TISCR, which is the tank site season removal. So for sure, you're going to deploy the TISCR, the tank site season removal, get that pretreatment capability up and running, which means it takes tank waste, uh, removes cesium and some particulates, and that prepares it for the low activity waste vitrification facility. That will become up and running. Um, we are in the process of studying whether or not we need to actually bring up that low activity waste retreatment system. We'll be making that decision over the next couple of years. The one change that we are making, at least initially, is this is a little bit techy, but um, there, the medium that we used to pull the cesium out on, you could remove the cesium from periodically and put it in, uh, back in the tank farms if you wanted. We can't do that here. That was called an eludible resin, a little bit techy, but 
we're going to go to a non-eludable resin. It simplifies initially what we're doing in the process, but in the long run uh, may uh, increase the cost, so we're going to have to make some decisions here. But we uh, are firmly entrenched that we do believe it's worth it to get the first ever Hanford tank waste be treated in that low activity waste vitrification facility. So remember I talked about the, the home plate on the, uh, that aerial diagram. Let's talk a little bit about what that, what that is. This is about a $17 billion project total spread over decades. Uh, what we plan on getting done in 2018 is the first bullet is um, much of the ancillary facilities will be complete in 18. They'll be up and operational and be able to be operated. Um, the low activity waste uh, facility construction where the vitrification will happen, the construction will be complete this year. What is lagging behind is what's called the, um, the EMF, which is the low uh, effluent management facility, and that handles the effluents coming out of the low activity waste facility. Um, so we'll be uh, pursuing uh, completion of all of those by 2022. We do have some technical issues associated with pretreatment. Um, that's why we've simplified it and are bypassing some of those technical issues for the time being. And those technical issues uh, will be worked on in 2018. And there's the technical issues. Um, as evidence of us treating waste as early as 2022, we're beginning to prepare for operations of those facilities. We've been in the construction mode for many years. So we'll be looking at the procurement of spare parts and training plans for workers that will begin to operate those facilities in the next four years. So that was, you know, about 10 minutes, $1.4 billion worth of work in one year. So let's move on to FY19, if you would. And this is the, the president's budget request to Congress. So I'm just going to hit, hit the high points, but you've heard me use, I'm going to go back to pretreatment, right? You've heard me use that term. Tisker, tank site, season removal. This is the artist's rendition of it. This is not pie in the sky and it's not new technology. Um, this unit has been shipped basically to Savannah River, our sister site down in South Carolina, and will be deployed this year. That unit right there is forecast to fit on the back of a semi truck just to give you some scale. So this entire um, unit would probably fit on about four or five semi trucks. And that would sit next to the AP tank farm um, to remove cesium prior to moving to uh, moving that waste to vitrification facility. Um, so the whole and then and then what we do is in, in parallel with deploying that mini pretreatment system, if you will, is continue to study the larger low activity waste pretreatment system to modify it and potentially deploy it at a later point in time thereby increasing their throughput and their abilities. Um, WTP, going back to that uh, major facility, uh, we will be continuing to move towards uh, operations of the low activity waste uh, vitrification facility, as well as the EMF, the uh, effluent management facility. And once again, as the RP 70 comes uh, further closer to operations, we will continue those commissioning activities um, procure the spare parts for eventual operation of that plan and initiate that facility transition plan from construction to operation as early as 2022. So we're, we're committed here to maintaining uh, worker public safety. We're committed to continued progress and we appreciate and welcome your input. Let me just close by this is uh, I always appreciate your, your attendance here, I really do. I mean, there's lots of things you can choose to, to done tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks also to the people on the webinar. I really appreciate you tuning in here. And I never fail to learn something or, or see a new way of looking at things. So thank you very much. And I look forward to, to learning a new way of looking at something. So thank you. So this is John Price with the Department of Ecology. Thank you. So, um, so I hope you'll bear with me. I'll, this will go pretty quick and we'll get the EK perspective. Um, so I'm going to try and I'm just going to comment on the president's FY19 budget and I'm going to try and convince you um, that, 
the Hanford cleanup is falling farther and farther behind schedule, and I'm going to try and explain why that is happening in just three simple slides. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Can we see the whole slide at once, or is we a little bit of that? I see all. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, Office of Management and Budget role. So the Office of Management and Budget is actually in the White House and writes the budget for the president. And the federal budget process is difficult to understand. This slide is way too complicated, so I'm going to cut out half of this if you do that for me. And I just wanted to highlight a couple things. Um, so the local offices here, Richland and ORP, they went through um, what the work that they do. And each of those offices is required each year to submit to DOE headquarters um, a budget request that covers all of the work required to comply with federal and state laws and regulations. And that, that is really formulated around the schedules that we put into the tri-party agreement as milestones. So each and every year, compliant budgets are submitted up to DOE headquarters. Um, DOE headquarters receives those requests and then sends them over to the Office of Management and Budget, OMB. OMB reviews those budgets, returns the budgets to DOE headquarters for revision. We never see what kind of comments they make, but that's, that's one step of the process. DOE headquarters revises the budget based on OMB um, comments and returns them to OMB. OMB reviews those revised budgets, make other changes, and then they write the president's budget that they send over to Congress. Um, so that is how the president's FY19 budget happens. We don't know the back and forth between DOE headquarters and OMB, but that's what the process is. Go ahead and hit the next slide. Um, so on the left, you have an excerpt from a um, DOE presentation from 2012, and that was um, done by the uh, DOE Environmental Management Office Deputy, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Program Planning and Budget. And at that time, DOE EM acknowledged that the Hanford budget was 25 years behind schedule. So normally when you're behind schedule with something, you want to apply more money and resources to it to try and catch up. Um, that is not the guidance that the Office of Management and Budget provides. Um, greatly paraphrasing, in 2017, they provided guidance to all federal agencies for their federal fiscal year 2019 budget submission. That's what we're talking about tonight. And their guidance, OMB, was to assume that DOE and other agencies would basically continue receiving the same amount of money that they've received in the past. So even though the amount of money that DOE had been receiving was causing the Hanford and other cleanup to fall behind schedule, OMB guidance was to stay the course. Can go ahead and give me the next slide, please. So that's, um, so I'm gonna give you a very high level, um, no details about um, where we are with the Hanford budget. So I have two offices, DOE Richland and DOE Office of River Protection, um, and I'll go across those one by one. So. Um, for 2019, the le compliance level budget request for Richland was $1.385 billion, and that was the amount of money that was required to comply with all the TP milestones, federal laws, and, and state and federal laws and regulations. OMB developed a budget of $747 million. So OMB, um, in developing the president's budget, cut $638 million from the amount that was required to comply with all federal and state laws and regulations and meet TPA milestones. Similar story on the Office of River Protection side. So the compliance level budget for, for FY19 is $2.1 billion. OMB cut that to $1.44 billion, which is a cut of $660 million. So if you do the math on this, um, with that kind of cut, Richland will fall behind another year every two years at budget at this level, and ORP will fall behind another year every three years if funded at this level. So in 2012, DOE um, said they were 25 years behind schedule at Hanford, and the budget course that's being provided by OMB is going to mean that that um, schedule will fall farther behind schedule. Thank you. 
just a few last things. I know everybody's been very patient waiting for questions. So I'm Laura Bulow. I'm here with the local office for EPA. Um, for any of you that knew Dennis Falk, he retired last summer, the end of the summer. Uh, Dave Enan was named our new manager uh, a few months ago. He's at a public meeting up in Alaska tonight, so I am here tonight. Um, so from EPA's perspective, uh, we are still waiting to hear from Department of Energy exactly how the budget, even from FY18, is going to impact uh, the milestones that we have. So we've got 26 pages of milestones in our tri-party agreement, and these have been all agreed to by the tri-party agencies. And we basically have asked Energy to let us know, you know, how the budget from FY18 is going to impact these milestones. Because we're looking at it from many different things, not only the active work that we all like to see get done, but we need to have a balance between getting the work done and also having regulatory documents in place so that additional work can keep getting done. There's mention of um, the records of decisions. There's, you know, there's still final decisions to be made along the river corridor that we've been working towards. But until those final decisions are made, that's when, from EPA's perspective, we would consider it done on the river corridor. And those are still um, being put in place. Uh, we are waiting to see how some of the impacts from PFP are going to affect the um, budget from other priorities in FY18 um, and how that funding might come from other um, projects. And uh, I will say the one thing about and the president's budget is not the final budget. Um, we hope always that it gets a little bit better in these cases, um, but that is what we have to start planning for as far as what priorities we do. So with that, I will say that um, EPA very much appreciates you guys coming out, and we do want to hear your feedback as far as priorities, because Energy has come to us and has been asking us what our priorities are, and right now our answer has been, well, it's the milestones that we've all negotiated in here, but with the budget and what John just said, um, if those milestones aren't able to be met, then we need to start thinking about what gets done sooner and what milestones potentially could get pushed out, and that's where your input is very valuable to us. So with that, I'll turn it back, and I think it's time for questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you again. Uh, let's see if we can get this fired up. To our panelists, um, and uh, John, John alluded to it, and I think I forgot to uh, mention it up front, but we do have a webinar component of this meeting. So we do have some folks, uh, this meeting is being recorded, we, we do have some folks joining us online and they will be able to, they were able to hear and view the presentations and be able to ask questions uh, that will be related to our panelists. So um, for them, so folks online can hear, I want to make sure to pass the mic around uh, for folks um, to ask their questions to uh, our panel. And uh, with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take the first question. Um, Are the documents that you use for your presentations available online? <laughs> they are. They will be online at the conclusion of this meeting. So they'll be on Enter.gov. Um, if they're not already, they will be tomorrow morning. And there's a banner at the top of the Enter.gov website that has a link that says to make a 
combination of how much of the PDLs that are being produced actually the reduced Columbia River soil and groundwater. And um, it's pretty significant, but it's hard to tell because the PDL covers both central plateau and the river plateau. So I'm wondering if you've got figures for that and what are the implications as we're looking at, for example, the or advisory boards that is sacrificed on the beyond of the DC area where there's a lot of concern about not doing free roll and not doing any proper treat. Um, it's hard to offer comments without being skeptical about it being budgeted and you see it and it is nice to make over a million dollar reduction. Uh, so what's your figure for river harbor cleanup so on groundwater um, for the investment level for LNT? I will do my best, Jerry. That was a long question. But so the, the first part of it's really quite easy. So even though the budget appears that PBS 30 is in the central plateau control point. PBS 30 actually funds both groundwater for the central plateau as well as the river corridor. Um, so as you can see, if you go from 17 omnibus, I'm on page five of this handout that I showed up there, which I think is what you're talking about. Okay, so I'll give I'll just give you the numbers. PBS 30 on FY 17 is 127 million. The FY 18 budget is 132 million, and and the FY 2019 OMB or the president's budget is 131 million. So there's no significant reduction to any groundwater uh, cleanup in the river corridor or the central plateau in the president's budget. So it is not broken out. The river corridor groundwater cleanup is in PBS 30. So that's the first part of your question. No significant reduction to groundwater in the president's budget. What was the second part about BC? I apologize. That was difficult for me to understand. That answers the question. Okay. Um, I was concerned that um, I could break out the bus the central and river harbor in the third. So, uh, it's not broken that way. You bet. Does the apology for EPA have any concerns about the overall level of concerns about what it applies for the big milestones or the river harbor? Yes, and we've asked for that from energy as far as what the, not only the 18, I mean, that's kind of the first question that we've had is in FY18 budget, how many of these milestones are going to be impacted from that? And we've requested that from energy and we have yet to see their response. I'll kind of echo that. Ecology is very concerned that we've asked for specific impacts and we don't have any detail about specific impacts yet. Hey, um, let, me, let me just answer that real quickly. As I started out, you know, the, the president's budget for FY18, the year we're in, was $800 million. And about a month ago, we got a plus up to $947 million. So we are working diligently. We, we did some work. You know, it was a lot of ongoing work. We had some work that we were doing a little bit at risk, you know, with carryover and other things. So. We're trying to get really good answers for our regulators. So, but it's, even though it looks like we're almost seven months into the year, we haven't really had our budget for about a month to know exactly what we're doing. So we will give you those answers. I'm just trying to put it in a little bit of context. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, Peter. Yeah. Um, it's okay. Yeah, well, we had a comment from the webinar that just if the panelists could summarize the question asked, might be easier for them to follow or I can do that. So just that was a request from online. The two major contracts are out. Well, I, I guess Hank Park is going to be extended for a year, but the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the request for 
proposal for the RL site that's on the street now, correct? And if so, in this budget for FY20, and the impact also will be felt in FY19, I suspect. Now, you worked on the Hanford site when there was a contractor changeover. It cost millions of dollars. Where is that? What, what cleanup will be done if, if that's, I mean, something has to get affected by that changeover? The new contractor coming in wants to put their name on everything and all that rework and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it costs a lot of money when they have a new contractor coming in. It's not a surprise to anybody sitting up there. So, where is that in these budgets? And the MSA, I think, is out on the street now, the health contractor. So, so all these major contracts are going to take money out of cleanup. And where does that show up? It's in PBS 201. Okay. Uh, you are correct. There is some transition costs associated with new contracts. Uh, but more context. We must comply with the federal acquisition regulations as we put contracts in place. There are limits on the amount of time you can have them run. The limits in the federal acquisition regulations for these types of large cost reimbursement contracts are 10 years, and they want you to have them recompeted because they think competition drives performance, drives better performance. So we are in the process of, as you know, putting five major cleanup contracts out for bid, occupational medicine, 222S lab, mission support contract, tank operations contract and central plateau cleanup contract. So we're in the process of putting all five contracts out right now. Some of them have draft RFPs on the street. You will find more draft RFPs and then final RFPs and then proposals and then ultimately we'll get uh, contractors on board. So um, I don't mean to say it this way. We don't have a choice. We have to do these competitions. Um, there, are, there are some costs associated with them. You know, Two, three, four million dollars probably on the major ones per you know for a transition, but we have five of them, so there's been, there will be some costs in uh, in transition. Ultimately, the concept is that you're going to drive better performance, you're going to get competition, new innovative ideas. Um, that's why the FAR sorry FAR tells you to do that. Okay, thank you. We see we have a question from the webinar from Ann Larson. And ask this is for, for John Sean. I'm concerned about adequate funding for a low activity waste pre-treatment system loss this year and next. We know that loss will work and will be low activity waste. The increased focus on in farm pre-treatment is not proven and could generate ammonia vapors. Please explain funding proposed for loss in the proposed budget. So the, the meat of that question. All right, thanks, Peter. I appreciate that. The, the whole key here is to treat tank waste, right? It's to vitrify the waste and put that vitrified waste into the ground for safety disposal. So that's the goal. That's the other process. So how, how do you get it from tanks to the vitrification facility to vitrify it? Well, it has to go through a pre treatment step. And there's lots of ways you can do that, right? And so WAPS that we have to talk about, the low activity waste pretreatment system is one way. Um, the Tisker tank site Caesar removal is another way. So the plan is, is to deploy this Tisker uh, initially to get that waste to the vitrification facility, get the waste vitrified, and then get it uh, into the ground. Um, LOPS um, is a major facility. Remember, it's not the top of the smaller one that fits on the back of the semi-trailer potentially. Um, it experienced cost growth, cost growth that was unacceptable to the Department of Energy, and that's one of the reasons we're, when um, um, we're going to try to um, deploy that facility later on at, at a reduced cost. Um, but in the meantime, we meet the ultimate goal of vitrifying waste. So we're going to use FY18 to figure that the pathway through to what's the best way to uh, pre-treat the waste prior to going to the vitrification facility. I would add that you know the Tisker is a way to meet the current the current uh, commitments that the Department of Energy has made with regards to low activity waste vitrification. It meets the requirements. Thank you, John. No 
we have one more um, webinar from David Smith. We were asking about quote unquote priorities pursuant to the NY18 budget. We believe the first priority should obviously be one, prevention of leaking tanks of transuranus into the groundwater aquifers, and two, prevention of transuranus into the river. Surely you, DOE, incur. That was the last part. You, does DOE concur that first priority should be prevention of leaking tanks of transuranus in the groundwater aquifers and prevention of transuranus in the river? Yeah, the, our highest priority what it was was in the those exact work is safe operation of those tanks and for for the degradation of tanks and the migration of that waste, not only just transuranics, just all waste in those tanks in the environment. Thank you. Peter. Yeah. Okay, and folks on the webinar, if, if they have follow up to the responses, please, uh, please let us know.
Well, let me make sure I got the first part of the question right, if you would. And let me know if I don't have this right. You know, so when you know, we have a, what we call a Executive Order 12088, which is a requires us to request the full amount of money to be environmentally compliant with relative to the commitments, and of course, both the Office of River Protection and the Regional Operations Office um, submit a completely compliant budget request. You know, and that executive order is not new. It's been around since 1978, I think it is. So we do that, and that's what John showed earlier about the, for ORP, I'll speak for ORP, of about, uh, of about $2 billion. Um, and you see the numbers on my chart added up to about $1.4 billion. Now, that's not yet an appropriation. It's the president's recommendation of how much to fund Hanford. And we can get a lot of work done for $1.4 billion. Now, in terms of the gap, what we do is we do forward the impacts of the, the, the absence of that $600 million. And in our particular case, it comes in two areas in that year. One area is I address them both is the single shell tank retrievals, and that compresses the amount of time that we have to perform those legally required retrievals. Um, and but it's not yet an appropriation yet, so we have made those impacts, uh, uh, given those to our headquarters counterparts. The other part of that six hundred million dollar delta difference, if you will, is in the high level waste and pretreatment facility and. Harkening back to my presentation, I didn't go over very uh, completely, but there were some uh, technical problems with the original pretreatment pre system, as well as the high-level waste vitrification system. So in the course of solving those technical problems, it may reduce the amount of budget required. We're not there yet, um, but we based our original budget submittal on the, the old plan, if you will. So that's how we choose to, to deal with that. Um, it's not good news. But we haven't yet gotten appropriation, and we might be able to deal with it or some of that if the difference of between the 1.4 billion and the 2 billion. Did that answer your question? I think so. As long as headquarters understands the impact of less than the compliance budget being allocated, ultimately. Right, right. And understand that from you. Right, yes. On both sides, on both the RL and the ORP side, for sure. One um, of the other contexts, sorry, on the mic, but I think you all can Oh, yeah, thank you. One of the other points of reference is uh, if you look at it as a site, the site in FY18 is getting 947 plus one point, what is the R4 if you could combine 18? 1.5. So almost $2.5 billion out of a $6 billion EM cleanup budget. Um, just for context, I mean, it's not good. We need, you know, there's a lot more work to do, as we talked about, than there is funding to get it accomplished. But it is a significant amount of the overall cleanup budget uh, for the United States of America. You know, but it's not, it's not meeting the regular requirements. That's true. Yes. Um, from EPA's perspective, we've we've been more willing to push out milestones and extend the amount of time to take the work than compromise on, say, cleanup levels. It's like, take for the river corridor. We've stuck to the unrestricted use of river corridor, so we've been more willing to push out um, the milestone dates on things than we are to say, eh, we'll just change it all to an industrial standard or something like that and change the cleanup standards. That's been kind of our approach. Yeah, so I think the question was, you know, what is ecology doing to forcefully respond to the, you know, uh, budget being less at compliance levels? There's kind of a, a two-part answer to that. I think one is in past years, we've been kind of informal about the milestones that DOE was going to miss. And we've let those pile up for a couple of years at a time and have done a bunch of milestone changes all at once. We did that in 2016. Um, I think this year we're being a lot more formal about it. We've asked DOE um, to inform us specifically what milestone impacts they see both in 2018 and in 2019 that will come. And there's a process in the tripartite agreement where they're supposed to inform us of milestone impacts and then go through the process of, of changing the milestones. I think we'll do that a lot more deliberately in, in the future. So the second part of the answer is, um, 
you know, Collegy can't uh, order Congress to appropriate enough funds, but one thing we have done is we've taken specific work that we thought was priority and we've issued separate orders to DOE to do that work, and that's been pretty effective. We've done that for the Purex tunnels, for example, we've done that for the uh, double shell tank AY-102 in the past, and we'll do that from time to time, but we can't do that across the board because we can't make Congress appropriate all the funds needed. Okay, thank you, John. Let's take one more question from the webinars, another question from David Sins or ORP. And David, please tell us if we have the correct slide up here that you're referencing. In one of the prior slides, you spoke of quote unquote project controls, which have put into place, been put into place to mitigate or altogether reduce occupational exposure to toxic gases associated with the tank farm. How do we address these project control measures in more specific? Thank, thank you. So, um, just to frame this, um, the tank farms are a highly hazardous environment to work in, right? Um, they've got high levels of radioactivity in the tanks. They've got uh, hazardous chemicals in the tanks and hazardous vapor. So, it's and you know, we have highly trained workers. Um, if they're not trained to go in, they don't go in. And, and we uh, uh, protect our workers on several levels, but there is a, an overarching um, improvement in the way we protect our workers. Um, right now, they're focused on having what's called personal protective equipment, which is um, air that comes in through either through a hose to a mask or on a tank on, on your back and other uh, equipment that the workers are in that um, protects them, but it's cumbersome to work in, and from an overall perspective, is not the optimal way to have workers work in a, in a hazardous environment, potentially hazardous environment. So we're moving more towards what's called engineering controls, so that the, the potentially harmful aspects of the tank farm don't have a chance of reaching your worker, and they don't have to wear that personal protective equipment. But like I said, these, this problem has evolved over decades, and it's not gonna get solved overnight. But an overarching objective is to move from um, personal protective equipment to just a, a generally safer environment where that protective equipment is not required. Any other questions from the audience? Any other questions online? Yeah, do you want me to read one question? Okay. Uh, this is from David, he said, kindly address public concerns regarding the plutonium processing facility being over budget at six and a half billion with steel, which has not been NQA-1 tested from China. Scroll down. What is the corrective action plan? Is there one in place currently? I need a clarification. Um, I think we're talking about a steel quality assurance problem. Um, that's not with the plutonium finishing plant. That we we have an issue with the uh, waste treatment plant. So is there a way to get back with David to make sure I'm answering the right question here? Is, it, is the pilot waste facility being referenced? He said I did. And I think hopefully if we have David's contact info, we can follow up yeah. with him, follow up the meeting if there's clarity that's needed. Yes, Jerry.
forth with other river Colorado And I would like to hear very clearly, as I've been trying to explain, that look at what the cut is for our members and what it means. And I, it looks like a many four million dollar cut or a river card work. So A, what would be cut? And B, um, does this mean that you're not budgeting for startup of new mediation? I probably don't have a really fulfilling answer for you because we're still working on that with the president's budget request. Um, some of it is work completion, as you know, a lot of the work in the 300 area is complete. By 19, we hope to have most of the waste site under the 324 building uh, complete. Um, this, uh, most, much, much of the work in uh, the 100 area is funded out of uh, a different PBS. Uh, the sludge work is done out of PBS 12. Um, ultimately, if we get to dewatering the basin, it would be done um, in the river corridor PBS and interim safe storage of those reactors would be done in PBS uh, 41. So some of the work is work completion, Jerry. Um, that's As we mentioned, it's planned to have the river corridor PBS decline, but as we're showing on these charts, there's lots of work to do in the Central Plateau. There's, uh, you know, I went through a lot of it before. So it's, it's not uh, unusual to have the River Corridor PBS decline. Can I tell you that we're, if you go to the, our compliance request, you'll see that the request in PBS, or sorry, in the River Corridor and other cleanup operations um, is significantly higher at the compliance amount but there are also our work completions that are that are occurring. So, like I said, probably not 100% fulfilling, um, but our compliance 12088 request was significantly higher than um, the $89 million in the president's budget. So, is the compliance, is, is that compliance request available for the public or will we post that on I believe those letters are, um, I'll find out. I don't, I don't know. But we'll have to get back to you. Steel. So, you know, these are these are nuclear plants, and the steel has what we call a pedigree. So we need to know that the steel is as strong as the steel that we ordered and we put into our design and our drawings. And there was some steel that was purchased by Bechtel National, and in fact installed in the plant that doesn't have the necessary paperwork associated with it. And we're aware of the condition. Bechtel National is working on it to find that paperwork, and we just have to wait to let that process play out to see what happens, and, and I can't go into what we're going to do if we can't find the paperwork. That's a whole different issue, but we're aware of the problem. We're on top of it, and that is an answer. Simple question. What do you plan to do about it? This is still David. Yeah, we, we plan to wait to see what Bechtel's answer is. We hope that they can provide the necessary documentation. If they can't, we'll deal with it from there on. So, thank you. 